the unfolding world events. And my goodness, at the moment, things are happening very, very fast. Much of that is captured in this picture here, but we'll have a look at that in a little bit more detail in a moment. But first of all, what we want to do tonight is we want to... Oops, I've gone too there. First of all, what we want to do is to go from the time of Brexit and we want to look at how God has been working, how Brexit fulfills Bible prophecy. And now, what's going to happen now? And the events that we've seen happening in Europe since that took place only about three weeks ago. It's absolutely dramatic, the speed at which things are moving. No shadow of a doubt about it. It makes us stop and think. Because in the Bible it says, speaking of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, it will be like the birth pangs of a mother with a child. And at the last moment, it speeds up, doesn't it? And finally the child is born. Well, events appear to be moving that way at this stage. But let's go back to Brexit. Here we are. Putin said, let's leave, because he wanted to see the EU break up. And he could see if Britain left, that would encourage that to break up. Whereas Obama would like Britain to be in there and the EU to stand together to keep Russia back. And of course, Mr Cameron said stay for business reasons. Whereas this man over here, well, for political reasons, he pushed that way. And he saw that as be the way in which things should go. But a lot of people have been involved in this discussion. Here's the headlines of one of the papers. EU going in the wrong direction, she says. And she quietly speaking to one of the politicians pointed out that she felt that Britain should leave. Britain should leave. Allow Britain to have its independence, so to speak. But more on that in a minute. Well, where did the EU really come from? Well, it really began at the turn of the last century. 1914-18 was the war to end all wars, the Great War. So scary, so terrifying, they said, look, that's it. We'll never have another war. But along came the Global Depression. And the consequence of that, the spin-off of that was World War II. Again, only a few years, 10, 20 years later on, they're in a world war again. Where's it going to end? Well, with the close of that war, nuclear weapons were used. Here we are, terrified. The bomb that has changed the world. If we have another war, where's it going to end this time? Where's it going to end this time? So Churchill, in 1946, stood up over in Germany and he said, look, we've got to change the way Europe's run. So that Germany doesn't feel it needs to occupy the other countries. They ought to be one united block. Something like the United States of America. Let's call it the United States of Europe. Of course it changed its name as time went by. Initially when it was set up, it was called the ECSC. The European Coal and Steel Community. Six countries joined it. Then a little bit later on, 1957, it changed its name to the EEC, or what we commonly call the common market. And then later, by 1993, it was called the EU. And when Britain was in it, it had 28 nations. And there we have a map of the area of the EU. Well, why would Britain want to leave? Well, you see, over the last couple of years, every now and again, headlines come up like this. Great Britain, out of the EU. Why would they want to leave? Well, here's the three key reasons. One, the first of that is immigrants were coming in, in huge numbers, particularly seeking access into Britain, which has got like a centre link like we've got, where social welfare was taking place and people could be helped. So people wanted to go there in big numbers. The papers did an analysis on what it was costing Britain on a daily basis. They looked at how much they spent and how much benefit they got back, and they said it's costing them, in Australian dollar terms, 37 million a day to remain. And lastly, you see, Britain has to pass through Parliament certain decisions and then send it over to the EU to see if it can get a tick, to see if they'd approve of it. They were losing their independence to some degree. And so they wanted to leave. 
Well, let's look at the first one just for a moment. Here's a little picture to show you one of the problems. You see, growing number of immigrants, look, just climbing, spiralling out of all order. Here's a picture from Turkey. People wanting to go to Greece, you see? And here they're boarding the ship. Just can't get enough space. People even be pushed off the other side. And they're desperately endeavour to get into Greece. And the commander of NATO says this. He says, some of these are being trained to, to follow terrorism and to be provided with weapons. And they're going to cause chaos in Europe. So Europe is panicking over this, and so is Britain. So the vote's put. And as the vote went on, as the day rolled on, things began looking like they were going to stay. Here we can see, most said Britain would remain. The voting, the betting, 78% said they'd remain. And so there was a growing in confidence in the finance and the exchange rate climbed, the price of shares climbed. And when we woke up in the morning, we were listening on the news and yes, they said, we're going to stay. A great deal of excitement amongst the business world. And all of a sudden, during that day, a massive thunderstorm, not my words, a massive thunderstorm from Europe smashed into the UK. More than 6,000 lightning strikes in one day over London. Huge. The result was terrifying. And the consequences were huge. You see, London is the business centre. They wanted to stay in Europe. They didn't want to leave. But you see, the consequence of that massive storm was people didn't leave their homes. Would you in these conditions? And look at this. And some of the polling booths were flooded. Underground railway lines at times were flooded. The consequence is huge as that storm moved up from Britain, from Europe into over London. And by the close of the day, many of the people in London hadn't voted. It would have swung the vote, they reckon. And the result, therefore, was that. Remain. That is in the EU. What London would have wanted, 48%. Those who said leave, 52% almost said let's leave. And so that carried the day. So by the end of the day, the result went the other way. Look, the exchange rate plummeted to the lowest in 30, for, in 30 years, right back to 1980 something, 1985 I think it was when that price of exchange rate was met. And the share market plummeted. It was a real bombshell, they said, to the economics of Europe. Well, we'll see as time goes by. You talk to me afterwards and I'll talk to you a little bit about what the consequence of that is going to be economically. And I think you'll see that it's probably going to help Britain, but we'll see later. But let's stick to the things that we're talking about tonight. Should we be surprised well, down through the years, over many, many years, we have been saying Britain cannot remain in the EU. It can't be part of the EU. There's Elpis Israel, way back, 160 odd years, 1848, Dr Thomas said, Britain cannot be included among them, that is Europe. And later, about 10 years later on, exposition of Daniel. At the time, the old world will be divided into two great adverse confederacies, of which Russia and Britain will be the powers thereof be chief. So they will go two different ways. And of course, more recent books. Graham Pierce said, Britain will separate from Europe. Paul Billington, Britain's eventual exit from Europe is a certainty. So we can see the situation developing. Well, how did it happen? Well, a storm did it. Is that a surprise to us? Well, not really. See, the Bible says God works through his angels who often use storms. Last month we've read of two occasions in the Bible, Bible readings that spoke of that. Praise ye him, all his angels. Praise ye him, all his hosts. Fire, hail, snow and vapour, stormy wind, fulfilling his word. So you see... We've anticipated it from the word of God over the last 140, 160 years. And sure enough, 
It's happened. God's work has been done. And Britain has left. But why does the Bible say that? How can we prove that? Well, Ezekiel 38 is really the beginning of it. Ezekiel 38 describes a massive invasion of the land of Israel by Russia and Europe, opposed by Britain. Now, let's first of all date this chapter. Let's see when it's being written. We've got it open before us from our readings. So when does Ezekiel 38 come to pass? Well, the best clues come from verses 14 through to verse 16. Let's have a look at them carefully. Verse 14. Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say unto Gog, Thus saith the Lord God, In that day when my people of Israel dwell safely, shall thou not know it? And that word there, safety, is better rendered confidently. Go to the Middle East. One of the most confident countries in the Middle East at the moment is Israel. It's in the land. When did that happen? From 1948 onwards. So it's in our day. Look again a little bit later on. And uh, just to highlight that, oops, let me go back. To highlight that, look at verse 16. And thou shalt come up against my people of Israel as a cloud to cover the land. It shall be in the latter days. And I will bring thee against my land that the heathen may know me when I shall be sanctified in thee, O Gog, before their eyes. So we can see Israel in the land and in the latter days. Clearly our time. While we're living today. But you see, what's going to happen at that time? What's going to happen in our day in the Middle East? What does this chapter say? Well, it says that land is going to be invaded from the extreme north. Look at verse 15. Let's read it carefully. And thou shalt come from thy place out of the north parts, thou and many people with thee, all of them riding upon horses and a great company and a mighty army. Now, Many of the modern translations, ESV, RSV and such like, render it the uttermost parts of the north. Now, I could ask the young people, how far north can you go? Well, if we go north from Israel, there's Israel and go north. We go right up here, we get to the North Pole. It's the furthest you can go after that, it's all south, isn't it? Okay? What's just south of the North Pole, the uttermost parts of the North Pole? Russia. Out of that area. There's going to come a invasion that's going into the Middle East. Russia will invade the Middle East. But now, who's going to be with them? Who's going to assist them? Well, have a look at verse 2 and 6. Now, we haven't time to look at it in any detail, but Russia is described in verse 2. And if anybody wants to ask me proof of that later, I'll be happy to give it to them. But let's read verse 2. Son of man, set thy face against Gog of the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him. Now, Gog is the name of the leader of Russia. It's not a name, but it's a title. The one at the top, the supreme leader. But he's also associated with Magog. Now, we're going to come back to that in a minute when we adapt. we'll have a look at the historians. Look at verse 6. Well, maybe verse 5. Linked with Arab countries, which Russia is already linked with. Persia, Ethiopia, Libya, with them. Uh, all of them with shield and helmet. But look at the next verse. Gomer and all his bands in the house of Tagama of the north quarters and all his bands and many people with them. So the ones we're going to look at is Magog and Gomer. Let's first of all look at Magog. The historian uh, Herodotus, writing about maybe before the time of Christ, he said this, he said, The ancient and widely extended people of Europe who spread themselves from the river Ross, uh, the river Don westward along the Danube, these are they of Magog. He used the term to describe that area. And so here is Magog. Between those rivers, it includes Germany, towards the, further to Wars, towards Hungary and such like, but it's northern and central Europe that it's been described. And the other country was Goma. Goma House has another name of the Gorgs. And those who are well read in their asterisks and obliques will know who the Gorgs are, the young ones here, because they come from France, don't they? So if we put them together, 
there we can see the alliance that's going to be formed. Russia, Rosh, Meshach and Tubal, verse 2. Along with Mago, verse 2. Verse 6, Goma. In other words, virtually all of Europe will be allied to Russia, will be united with Russia. That's fascinating. That's the way it's got to be scripturally. Now, we can prove that by other means. First of all, we take Daniel's image. There's Daniel's image, but you know, in a sense, you probably should see that laying down because after Babylon came Medo-Persia, after Medo-Persia came Greece, after Rome, uh, Greece came Rome, and after that, Europe. But if you come with me to Daniel chapter 2, that's the, not the way we should understand that. If you haven't coloured this in, this is worth doing so. Dr Thomas, way back in the 1840s, showed this to be quite different, really, in some regards. The whole image must stand up together. Daniel chapter 2. Look at verse 28. But there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. So this chapter describes this image and says it relates not to history down through time primarily, but to the latter days. Have a look at verse 35. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver and the gold broken to pieces together. So this has got to be united. It can't be one after another. It's got to be together. And lastly, come with me to verse 44. In the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever. So it's destroyed as one. So how can that be? Well, this is really what's going to happen. It's the territories. The territory of Babylon included Syria and Iraq. They've got to be united with Russia. The area of Medo-Persia is Syria and Iraq and Iran, Afghanistan and Pakistan. They've got to be united. And they are, at the moment, currently allied to Russia. And while Russia is in Syria, all of those nations, I think except one, has put troops with Russia in Syria. As well as that, Greece and Turkey. Greece is showing a tendency to turn towards Russia. Turkey is now very, very worried about Russia. And then East and Western Europe, united with the ten countries of Europe. And that's the area we're looking at at the moment. Got to be united with Europe. And Europe's got to break up into ten units. So we can see then. What will happen? It must break up into ten loose, loosely allied groups which will come under Russian control. Europe's got to break up. And in order to do that, it's got to be different to the way it is at the moment. So how is things going in Europe at the moment? It's looking chaotic. Even before Brexit, even before the British left, this is what Stratfor said. This is an American paper that's sent out to businessmen who pay for it, and it tells them what's going to happen and how things are going to move in the world scene. It's usually very accurate. And they say the world is breaking, uh, Europe is breaking up into emerging blocks various different blocks. Now, what did the Bible say it's going to break up into? Ten. Well, there they've got seven. But now, you see, the territory of the Roman power must be this territory here. So I'll put that line there on it. Let's do that. So it is more the central Europe that has been described as the territory of ten that was in the Holy Roman Empire. When the Huns, or when the Huns, the Vandals and the Visigoths occupied that area, sorry, in about 350 AD. So let's now look at the numbers that are the units down there. There is 10. And it looks like that group will be grouped together as a loosely configurated group held together by the clay, Russia. What about to the north of that area? Well, things are looking pretty scary there now. 
Russia is about to put nukes right on the NATO border, North Atlantic Treaty Organisation, Europe's border. Right now, look at the date. While Brexit was underway, while the vote was going on, Russia was moving nuclear power, nuclear missiles into that area. The Russians are able to move huge formations, said the leader of NATO. Lieutenant General Hodge went on BBC and they interviewed him in, one, in an interview that's called Hard Talk. And he was interviewed fiercely by one of the interviewers. And he pointed out, he said, it's really worrying. Russia can move rapidly troops up and down the borders of Europe. We can't. We can't. NATO needs to have the speed too, but we can't. We can't match it. And so they decided they'd better do something to try and tell Russia to back off. And they called together nations in Europe only a few weeks ago and did a manoeuvre called Anaconda 16 exercise in Poland. They called together from Europe and from America and from Canada 31,000 troops from 24 nations to show Russia they would do something. And how did Russia view it? Russia looks like it's going to try and capture this block over here. See that little red line? 40 mile chink in Europe's border. You see the north of that is Lithuania, Latvia and Estonia. The Baltic states. Then there is Kaliningrad. This little part there, Kaliningrad in yellow, is Russian territory. When the Iron Curtain came down 1989 through to 1991, thereabouts, the Russians never left that area. They retained control over it. They've got tens of thousands of troops there now. They've got many missiles in there. Many of those missiles they are now capping with nuclear weapons and saying to Europe, just look out. If you fail to do what we want or try to oppose us, we may use those. Then, this country here, Belarus, is pro-Russia. And just in the last few days, Russia has been moving large amounts of equipment into Belarus. They're building nuclear missile bases in Belarus. The point is, they can capture that 40 kilometre land bridge. Those countries to the north cannot get aid over the land. They can only get it from the air. The most northerly one, just off there, up there where my pointer is, Estonia, about six months ago said to America, we're terrified of what's going on. The Prime Minister of Estonia approached America and said, can't you put some troops here in Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania because Russia's building up huge numbers on our borders. America said, Obama said, Sure, we can help. We can land in your airports, our soldiers, in 48 hours, two days, and we'll be landing. The Prime Minister came back and said, it's not good enough. Russia has a highway where they bring trade into Estonia, into the capital city of Estonia, and they'll be in our city in four hours. And they'll overrun the whole of the country in something like about 60 hours. You landing a few troops not going to do anything. So Russia, America said, all right, we'll do something. So they sent troops to Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania. They sent 150 to each country. 150 troops. Why? To hold the airports. That's not going to work. You need tanks, you need heavy equipment and such like. Can't get many of them coming in by plane. And on top of that, many of the people in these countries here are Russian-speaking. They were people who were Russians when the Iron Curtain was there. They set up businesses there. They came from Russia. They began to run the country when it was under Russian control back before 1990. And when Russia left, Russia was economically destitute. Oil price at one point had reached $12 a barrel. And Russia couldn't afford even you know, large quantities of food for its people. They were a really desperate plight. So the people, the Russians, didn't go home. They stayed. And now Russia has approached all of them and said, if you're Russian speaking, and you've got a, a young man in your household 
who's anywhere between uh, 18 and 35 year old, he's part of the Russian army. We will pay him eventually. He's not to wear the uniform. In other words, he's an insurrectionist. And when we come, he's on our side. And they're destabilising the country, destabilising each of those countries. And the percentage of pro-Russian, Russian-speaking people is huge in all of those countries, quite large and deep. So indeed, Russia could exploit this to launch an invasion. They could cut that off there and they could take control of those countries. The Baltic states, Latvia, Lithuania and Estonia would be left isolated and helpless to a Russian invasion. There's where the papers are going. Look again. Oh, sorry, we'll go back one. Russia could invade Europe in hours. The Baltic states issued shock warnings over Putin's plans. And this was again repeated only a few days ago. I told you about it earlier, about six months ago. But now they're saying it again. Russia could launch an invasion into Eastern Europe within hours. Poland and the Baltic states could be over in a moment. And further than that, the commander, the one we spoke about before, of NATO, who was interviewed on BBC, he said this, he agreed that the Russian forces could conquer the capitals of Baltic states, Latvia, Lithuania and Estonia in 36 to 60 hours, 60 hours, all over for those countries. So what are they hoping to do? They put 31,000 people, soldiers in NATO, manoeuvring them around, trying to say, look, we, we, we will react. Here's how the paper sees it. NATO allies have put four battalions at eastern border with Russia. See? A warning. Russia, if you come, we're ready for you. We want you to understand that we're going to respond. Let's have a look at some of the numbers. Russia has been calling up troops. As her economy has collapsed because the West isn't trading with her, many of the young people probably are out of jobs have been called into the army. About a year ago, they called up 80,000. Then a little later, 90,000 and so on. Today, these are only the call-ups, not the standing army. I can't get the figures easily for it. Just those extras have been called up. So NATO has 31,000 total. And here, they've got their normal standing army and the call-ups, 325,000 on the borders of Europe. Where's it going to go? Where's it going to go? Well, I think that they will take control of some of the northern states or countries. But in the south, I believe it's going to collapse and take, be taken over by alliance with Russia. Here we are. NATO unity tested by Russia. Shows some cracks. What is it? The New York Times, and look at the date. June the 8th, three days ago. It's starting to crack up. It's starting to break. Lurking beneath the veneer of unity was growing evidence in Warsaw, where all of the NATO nations had met together only a few days ago, of fissures, cracks within Europe. Germany and France and Italy are showing signs of wavering. Uh, Renzi of Italy recently took part in the St Petersburg Forum. That was a meeting to talk about how they're going to control Europe. He went up there, joined Russia in it. Hollande de France has talked about the need to engage Russia, engage with Russia, that is. A former United States ambassador to NATO said, I was struck by the divisions within Europe's leadership. Eventually, it will be 10. And so Europe is breaking up before our eyes. But let's come back to Ezekiel 38 for a moment again. You see, the Middle East is going to be invaded, isn't it? Ezekiel 38 says that. But when it does, who opposes the Russian alliance? That alliance between Russia and Europe, who's going to oppose that? Let's look at the names. We'll pick it up in verse 11. And thou shalt say, I will go up to the land of unwalled villages, that's Israel. I will go to them that are at rest, that dwell safely or confidently, all of them dwelling without walls, having neither bars nor gates, to take a spoil and to take a prey, to turn thine hand upon the desolate places that are now inhabited and upon the people that are gathered out of the nations which have gotten cattle and goods 
and dwell in the midst of the land. There's Israel. It's going to be invaded by that confederacy we spoke about. Russia joined with Europe and many of the Arab countries. But look, verse 13. Sheba, Dedan, and the merchants of Tarshish, with all the young lions thereof, shall say unto thee, Art thou come to take a spoil? Hast thou gathered thy company to take a prey, to carry away silver and gold, to take away cattle and goods, to take a great spoil? And so we see these nations are trying to oppose that invasion. Who are they? Here is why we are so confident Britain had to leave Europe. Could be no part of it. This is Britain, as we'll see in a moment. So who is this Ezekiel 38 Tarshan power? Who's it talking about that opposes that Russian-European alliance? It's Britain. Now, the evidence for this is substantial. Many of you will get a copy of this, one way or another, in a few days' time. But who is Tarshish? Who is the Tarshish of Ezekiel 38? Well, let's break it up a bit. There's a mass of evidence. Let's take it bit by bit. Let's take the first three. Now, come back with me to this quote, Ezekiel chapter 27, verse 25. Ezekiel 27, verse 25. And uh, well, first of all, look a little earlier than that. Let's come back to uh, verse, 13, uh, verse 12. Tarshish was thy merchant by reason of the multitude of the kind of riches with silver, iron, tin and lead, and they traded in thy fair fairs. So it's a trading company. It's a merchant company. Now look with me to verse 24. Five, the ships of Tarshish did sing of thee in the markets, and thou wast replenished and made very glorious in the midst of the seas. So the first thing is we see it's a maritime power. It's a trading power. It's an island-based power. And it's an island found, well, we won't turn to it, but Jonah. You may remember Jonah wanted to go to Tarshish. He didn't want to go and curse Nineveh. So got a boat going the other extreme of the world. Get away from it as far as he could go. <coughs> and so he went in the ship of Tarshish. Now Tarshish sailed to the west and also to the east. It sailed from this area down here, but we're not going to deal with that tonight. So in order to do that, there's what he planned to do. He planned to go to Britain, which is Tarshish, as we'll see in a few minutes' time. Further evidence for it? Look what it traded in. We read that a second ago. Traded in tin, lead. If you're not so good at the chemistry, there's the words of the metals that it traded in. It brought into the area of Europe copper and tin to make bronze for weaponry. That would have been huge demand in those days, in the Grecian days. Where do they find it? The dark green areas here are mining areas, where they mined in those days. Now, you can't see it easily from there, but if you look closely at it, you'll see signs SN, tin, copper, lead, and such like, all across the southern part of Britain, across Cornwall. Off the coast of Cornwall, they found wrecks under the sea. They've been able to pull them up, ancient wrecks, try to recover them. They're in a museum there in Cornwall. And inside those wrecks, they found ingots. See the dip in the ingot? They could... The, hull of the ship was made with wood and they would sit the tin ingot across that so it wouldn't move in the high seas. And here's some tin ore found in that area. So it was an area famous for tin mining. So says the Encyclopedia Britannica. Much of the tin used by early Mediterranean people apparently came from the Scilly Isles and Cornwall in the British Isles where tin mining dates to at least 300 to 200 years BC. And it kept on going for many, many years. Today you can go to Cornwall and see mines probably built a couple of hundred years ago, now in ruins. In this case, they, the tin was so rich they mined down, followed the load several kilometres out under the sea, underground. But they took that tin and brought it into the European area along with other metals to make the weaponry and such like that was greatly desired in those years. But as well as that, it's a modern nation. We saw that. 
Because in Ezekiel 38, it's named with Russia and all those countries invading the Middle East, that invaded the Middle East or will invade the Middle East. It's allied to the Gulf states. Sheba and Dedan, we'll look at that very briefly later, is in the area of the Persian Gulf, uh, sorry, the uh, Saudi Arabian Gulf. Okay, to the south, Yemen is Sheba. Dedan is mainly part of that Gulf. And so they trade with them, they're involved in a global market, and they have strong ties with Israel. See, they defended Israel in Ezekiel 38. When Russia invades it, they will say, what do you come down for? So they've got to be a friend of Israel. And is that the case now? Look at that. Newspaper. OK, a couple of years old, last year. UK and Israel trade hit record high, 2014. So they're very closely linked to Israel in trade. And here's a ship coming into Haifa Harbour, loaded with equipment and stuff, coming from Britain. But as well as that, if you look back at Ezekiel 38, it goes on to say, and the young lions thereof, implying that Tarshish is the old lion. So who are the young lions? They are those who are affiliated with Britain. There's a World War I poster, another one. Britain is symbolised by the lion. Go to China, the symbol of China is the dragon, isn't it? Come to Australia, my wallaby of the kangaroo, and New Zealand, the kiwi. But really, the Commonwealth is described as the old lion, Britain, and here we are, Canada, India, Australia, South Africa, and so on. Unfortunately, New Zealand doesn't get represented there, but she's also part of that. There we can see... Not a very sharp picture, I'm sorry about. But there we can see the Commonwealth countries, the young lions associated with the old lion, Britain, united together. Now, for us, the critical question is when? When's it going to come to pass? Now, I don't want you to turn these quotes up, time's rushing away from us. But one of our writers many years ago said this. Is look, Collier. At the beginning of the Second World War, Russia joined with Germany. Rosh, Meshach and Tubal joined with Magog. And Brethren wrote to him and said, surely that means this year, well, this war will lead to Armageddon. He said, no, no, no. He said, don't want to take too much by dates, but we'd be foolish to overlook them. We shouldn't be indifferent. That date is, by, he said, the year when Russia will move into the Middle East. He said, was, well, and it did. Last year, September, Russia moved into the Middle East. That was written back in 1941, repeated in 2004, and repeated again in 2015, before the event. And so, what's the basis? It's Daniel chapter 7. What's said three times in Daniel chapter 7, that three of the ten horns in the past will be plucked up and given to one horn, which is the papacy. And it's said three times. Nothing else in that chapter except one point is said three times. It's really being emphasised. It's there in verse 8, verse 20, verse 24. It's got to be important. So go back to Wikipedia. Ask Wikipedia, when did the three horns, three territories in the Italian peninsula, get plucked up and given to the papacy? This man did it, the father later on of Charlemagne, Pepin the Short. The year 755 to 756, what he did was he invaded that land, took control of these separate countries and gave it to the papacy with the hope that he might get a ticket to heaven. He thought, well, that's one good way to get immortality ultimately. It didn't actually take place on one year. It took two whole years to do it. And so in those three quotes, we have that date. Now... That meant that that territory must be controlled by the papacy or the papacy must have political control for 1,260 years. Is the papacy in control politically at the moment? Who runs Europe? The EU. Well, the EU is really ruled by Rome today. This man who's the leader of the EU, the head man, Hermann von Rumpai, he made a, bit of a, made a bit of a blunder at one time. The papers went crazy. He said, most of the guys running the EU went to the same school 
They said, save school? They looked it up and I chased the looking the articles on it that were coming up. And what they found was it wasn't the same school but the same type of school. They went to Jesuit high schools. Jesuit high schools. Now, one of those is no longer, I think, in the EU block, helping run the EU. But at the point at which that was said, there were six, the Pope himself and the other two, five gentlemen there. This one runs the bank. This one is fundamentally in charge of the EU. The top men are that. And so we can see six Jesuits rule EU. Now, who's a Jesuit? He's a Roman Catholic priest who doesn't have to use the uniform. And that's what they are. But how long is it going to last for? And in his hand until time, times and dividing of times. So let's do the sums. So from 755 to 756, Wikipedia, those territories would be ruled by the papacy or the papacy would continue to rule politically. Let's do the sums. Not hard. 2015, and it was take over two years. Russia moved in last year in September, so it should run through to about 2017. More things could happen in that area. And my belief is the EU will break up in that time and Russia will affiliate with it. And the political power of Europe will be taken over by Russia, not by the Pope, by Russia. And the Pope will remain a religious head. What is the paper saying now? Look at the date. Real danger isn't Brexit. It's the EU break up. The Guardian newspaper, not a light reporter. He says, the unionists could be destroyed while Russia waits to prey on its remains. That's exactly what the scripture says. Putin's Russia has a vital interest in the breakup of the EU. EU falling apart. Again, the Express, a London paper. Now Holland wants its own referendum to follow historic Brexit vote. Nine out of ten Dutch people want to vote. Hey, you wouldn't ask for a vote if you wanted to stay, would you? And now, after Brexit or the day it closed, here's the Washington Post. What does it say? These countries could be the next to leave the EU. Now Britain has left. Sweden, Denmark, Netherlands, Poland, Hungary, Greece. It's looking fractious even now. And here's a political cartoon we saw before, very acute. Here's Britain leaving. And here we can see economic problems coming. Virtually every country in Europe is in economic strife. They needed the money from Britain. Things are falling apart. Here's Mrs Merkel saying, you know, trying to save the ship. And it's about to go over the, debt, over the top. And the problem, one of them is debt. I think it's a very entertaining cartoon. Here, incidentally, is Greece. <laughs> vomiting over the side, seasick. She's having problems. But anyhow, let's leave that behind. So the papers are seeing it. They're even producing cartoons like this to show the Britain is about, the EU is about to break up. But now, time's not with us to turn this up, but Daniel 11, talking about the same time period, vital to remember that. Speaking of Russia, he shall enter also into the glorious land. There's the invasion. And many countries shall be overthrown, but these shall escape out of his hand. These are those that are going to oppose Russia somewhat. Even Edom, Moab, and the chief of the children of Ammon. It's the territory of Jordan today. So if we look at a map, there's our quote that we looked at a minute ago. He shall enter also into the glorious land, and many countries shall be overflown. So Russia is going to, as Ezekiel 38 says, invade the Middle East. When it invades the Middle East, it's going to be opposed by Tarshish, Sheba, Dedan, and here we know Edom, Ammon, and Moab, that territory there. What appears to be hap going to happen is into that territory will come the, the British and the Commonwealth countries to oppose Russia's invasion. And so indeed, they will oppose that at that time. He shall, sorry about that PowerPoint, I don't know what's gone wrong there, but he shall enter into Moab, into the land, and also Moab, and the chief of the children of Ammon, will oppose him. 
and so they will move into that area. That's not unlikely. Jordan today is controlled by King Hussein. King Hussein is the ruler, one of the key rulers in the area. He's very pro-British. His grandmother was British. His mother was British. He's three quarters British, one quarter Jordanian. Very pro-British. And as things have been going wrong up in this area, more on that in a minute, he's gone over to America and Britain and said, help me. And British and American troops have been coming into the Middle East, into Jordan, already. So Daniel 11 shows that Russia and Europe will invade Israel. They will be opposed at that time by Britain and her allies, Sheba and Dedan, based in Jordan. So let's have a look at a map. There it is. There's Dedan. There's Sheba. I believe the Dedan area is particularly that peninsula area. And Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish, Britain and the Commonwealth countries, will oppose this confederacy. See that brown area? They are the nations described in Ezekiel 38, combining together to invade the Middle East. Now, how are things going in the Middle East at the moment? Where's Britain? Two years ago, Britain moved back into the Persian Gulf, into the area of Bahrain. They had built a port there many years before and used it. Now they're going back into that area. Britain has established a permanent base near the US Fifth Fleet base in Bahrain. Great Britain announced that it's going to re-establish itself there. It had done so back then and now it's returned. And the whole of that peninsula at the moment is very, very worried. Very worried indeed. Saudi Arabia has given a call. We've got to be united. What are we seeing Russia moving up in? We're seeing ISIS. We're seeing trouble in Syria, chaos. So he called for help. An army of 350,000 troops joined together from various different nations. They came together. Here's a list of a few of them down here. Uh, six of the countries listed there. But it went on and on of the countries that were involved in this manoeuvre called Northern Thunder. Nearly 350,000 ground troops from 20 nations. Date? Only a few weeks ago. Manoeuvring in that Persian Gulf area because they're worried over what's taking place. Concerned over where things are going. And I'm not sure if this one's going to come out right. Let's have a look at this. Yes, it is. Good. On my PowerPoint here, it didn't look quite right. Anyhow, and right at the moment, Israel is being threatened. While fighting is taking place in Syria, and Russia's involved further to the north with the ISIS, ISIS and Al-Qaeda have put a, got control of the borders of Jordan and the northern border of Israel. ISIS and Al-Qaeda have overrun the entire Syrian strip, bordering on Israel and Jordan. It's not likely to remain that way. Israel's not going to be too happy by that. But look at the date. Only a few days ago. Where will it go? We don't know. But one thing's for sure. We know from Scripture that an alliance will form. USA, and no doubt Britain, Israel and Jordan will oppose the ISIS threat. They did so before, they are still doing so. Yes, it's back a bit. But USA and Israel are in close communication with Jordan. The Jordanian Hashemite Kingdom, a close Israeli and American ally. So now, those forces are in the Middle East. They're in that area and they are somewhat united to oppose what's taking place in Syria. Where will it end? We know what is going to happen. The Bible very clearly shows that Europe will unite with Russia, will invade the Middle East, and when they do, it will be opposed by the Tarshan countries. But before that happens, Christ will return. Look at this. Going aside now from our subject, we won't return to it anymore. It says this, Christ's last prophetical words before he was crucified, he said this, and there shall be upon the earth Distress of nation with perplexity. And that's a funny word, but it means no way out, no answer. So he says, before I return, I want you to understand 
that the world will be in an utter chaotic state, nobody will know the answer. And what we're seeing now looks that way very much. Like. Men's hearts failing them for fear, for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, heading to World War III. And then he went on to say this, and I think we need to pay attention to this acutely. He said, when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. Now I ask you, how long have we got? Has it begun? My goodness, it looks it. It certainly looks it. We haven't got long. And what's going to happen? Well, Christ will return. Acts chapter 1, verse 10, we know it off by heart. And he ascended, didn't he? He went up, and two men, two angels, stood by them in white apparel, which also said to the disciples, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. He'll return again. And when he does, he will bring finally world peace. As Revelation concludes, Revelation 21, second to last chapter, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall no more death, neither sorrow nor cry, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. A wonderful kingdom will be established worldwide, from one end of the earth to the other, even maybe China. <laughs> I like that picture. I thought it was a wonderful picture showing a good smile. And indeed, that will be the kingdom age. It will be a wonderful time at that time. But look, before Christ ascended, just maybe 10 minutes before, he turned to his beloved disciples and he said to them these words, and we need to notice this acutely. He said unto them, Go you into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And that's what we're trying to do now. He that believeth and is baptised shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be condemned. That's pretty straightforward. Three essential steps to salvation. Number one, believe the gospel, the good news that is found in the scriptures, that there is going to be a kingdom on this earth. There will be a resurrection. The fundamental knowledge of the scriptures we must know. And having but known that and believed that, we must then be baptised. Baptised in total immersion in water. Committing ourselves to serve God and his son. And then, remain faithful until he comes. Well, the days are indeed short. Has it begun to happen in the Middle East? My goodness, it has. Has it begun to happen in Europe? My goodness, it has. How long have we got? We don't know. At the moment, it looks like the birth pangs of a mother with a child. It's not as if we're waiting months. We only seem to be waiting days and weeks for the outside, and things are moving. So it's really appropriate for us. If we haven't been baptised, then look seriously at it. But if not, remain faithful until he comes. The time is indeed short. Thank you.